This is ThinkTech Hawaii, Community Matters. Welcome. Uh, this is your host, Craig Thomas, on Much More in Medicine, part of Think Tech Hawaii's live stream series, assisted by our engineers, uh, Rich and Ray. And joining me today are my colleagues, Diana Felton and Jeff Nance, uh, who both are treating patients at the Hyperbaric Treatment Center. Welcome. Hey, thank you. It's great to have you here. It's exciting times because the chamber's reopened. It's treating people uh, who have been diving and had an event. Uh, and I'm excited about it. So I'm glad you could share. I thought we'd start by setting sort of the framework and uh, the sort of underlying theme of our talks over the spring have been what makes up the pieces of our healthcare system? What conditions need early treatment and early recognition? And also, how do all the pieces fit together? So since this is an important piece for scuba divers particularly, but also some other poisonings and things, Diana's a toxicologist, so she may talk a little bit about those items also. I thought it was important to share with the community that the uh, University of Hawaii has uh, sort of uh, relaunched the center, and it, I, it's great news for all of us because, uh, as we'll discuss, you uh, need early recognition of symptoms, an early consultation, and if treatment's appropriate, uh, early treatment. And you definitely won't, don't want to be flying to San Diego, for example, to get that. So, uh, Jeff and Diana, let's talk a little bit about what are we treating? Why do, what's the history of gas bubble disease from compressed air? Because it isn't always just divers. It could be, for example, uh, construction workers working underwater, things like that. So, uh, who wants to go first? I'll start. Perfect. The initial recognition of decompression type illnesses was originally noted when bridge workers were being submerged into deep, uh, to deep underwater environments to build bridges. I believe the Brooklyn Bridge was when they first found the first cases and they found that these patients or people felt fine when they were working and then when they'd come up they started developing some really unclear symptoms. And some of it was pain related and they felt that they were bent over walking funny and so they gave it the name the bends. And that's how it started with the recognition of decompression illness. Exactly. And it turned out as time went on, and actually the early ex the experiments that elaborated this were many years ago. You may know the dates, Jeff. I don't, but it was I think close to a hundred years ago. It right? was uh, yeah, it was over a hundred years yeah. ago. Well over a hundred years ago. And they established that what was happening was the compressed air, and you're absolutely right, it was uh, working deep under the surface of the water, which required compressed air to keep the water out. Um, it was the compressed air dissolving in the people's bloodstream that then made bubbles when they came back up. Uh, so, Jeff, maybe you could describe the basic event of how, of how they discovered this and started a plan for how to both prevent it and treat it, and give us some history of uh, the Hyperbaric Treatment Center in Hawaii. As far as the, the caisson workers, you're referring to the caisson workers, yeah, well, they, the symptoms were, were obvious, but it was very mysterious for a long time. And the first person to come up with really a treatment protocol would have been um, Haldane, um, uh, who was commissioned by the Royal Navy. Um, and he came up with the first uh, tables for decompressing divers, essentially. Mm -hmm. And it's still, Haldanian theory is still used in, in um, um, you know, creating Honestly, it was, tables. It was impressive work because uh, <laughs> he figured it out and developed an effective strategy. So, and that was a long time ago. Yes, um, that was 1906, I believe. Was, that is yeah. a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, so, and the people at risk for this are people breathing compressed air and uh, under pressure themselves. So mostly that's scuba divers. Certainly in Hawaii, it's almost always scuba divers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it was recognized relatively early that uh, we had a need. And so why don't you tell us a little bit about the genesis of the Hyperbaric Treatment Center, where it started, and 
get us sure. through so the, status. The, the Navy used to treat the civilians, um, but there was enough dive cases um, prior to like 1980 that it, uh, the late 70s, the Navy said, we, we can't keep treating civilians. They were having to interrupt their training, um, all of their training scheduled to treat civilian divers. So um, at that point, Frank Farm, who's one of our founding entities and some other folks, uh, created the first um, hyperbaric facility, which was at the Kaka'ako facility. Mm -hmm. um, and they were busy enough that they got the funding to create the facility where we are now. So in a real nutshell, that's where, where it came from. Um, so this facility has been um, active since uh, 94. August mm -hmm. of 94, I believe, was the first, uh, tr they treated the first dive case. And you're actually a tenant <coughs> in the Kuakini Medical Center. That right? is correct, yes. Mm -hmm. We're part of the School of Medicine. Right. And uh, honestly, I've been there ever since. Yeah. And uh, there was a little reorganization last fall. And uh, part of the objective of the show is to make sure everybody knows that the uh, state and uh, university have sort of joined forces to uh, sort of reinvigorate the chamber. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think, treated a couple of dive victims in the last week. So uh, it's exciting times. Yes. And our chamber is pretty unique, Greg. It, um, it is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, um, which is not very common in this country. We also are, have, are what's called a multi-place chamber, which means that we're able to treat multiple patients at the same time. Mm -hmm. And we have actually two main chambers, so we can run them both separately with different um, timings and patterns at the same time. So it's a large facility, and there are um, we are the only uh, center in the state that has the capability to take a patient in with an attendant um, with them uh, to be able to treat diving emergencies, and also the only one that's available 24 hours a day. And in addition, this chamber has the capability of uh, a physician, perhaps, or some other worker entering the chamber while it's pressurized. You know, yes. There's an airlock right. system. And doing some uh, monitoring and uh, medical intervention while in the chamber, which is sometimes essential. Yes. Maybe the two of us, two of you could talk us through what it's like. Uh, you want me to start? Sure, you start. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of analogies people use, but it, it is fairly spacious, our chamber. Um, so it's, it's nice people to come in concerned about going in a little tiny tube are uh, usually pleasantly surprised. Um, you can sit, lay down, we can put a gurney in if need be, if the patients um, you know, require, so we can put on a, uh, a gurney. And we've actually had patients with as many as uh, three staff attending to them um, in there. So it is quite sizable. And during the, the treatments, the air within the pressure is similar to room air. It's <clears throat> compressed and pressurized mm -hmm. um, to a chosen depth. And there's different depths that are chosen depending on the problem. Mm -hmm. And but there are periods of when the treatment requires people to breathe 100% oxygen. Yes. So at that time, they have a plastic hood placed over their head, and they and 100% oxygen is piped into the hood alone. Yes. So they breathe that oxygen usually um, in a period of 20 to 30 minutes, and then a, a period of five to 10 minutes off the oxygen, then back on, and it rotates back and forth to give them. A, you know, as much oxygen as we can safely provide them at the pressurized depth. Yeah, which is a really interesting process because, uh, and just for the purposes of discussion, I think that you generally go to uh, an equivalent depth of on the order of 60 feet or thereabouts. 60 feet of seawater. Yeah, and that's yeah. close to two additional atmospheres of pressure, which is definitely noticeable. And I'm going to ask either or both of you to describe kind of what it feels like going down and coming back up. But just to touch briefly on the oxygen thing, too little oxygen is obviously bad, and too much, and oxygen is a gas, so how much you're getting is determined by the pressure as mm -hmm. well as the percent in the what you're breathing. Too much is also bad, and that's why uh, the process you described, Diana, is employed. 100% to try to keep the tissues perfused optimally, but a little time off to let it wash out. 
So let's let's describe. You go into the chamber, that uh, flimsy little door. It's about four inches thick, I think. Yeah, it's like seven hundred pound door. The seven hundred pound door shuts gently behind you and gets and it does. It fits perfectly and gets dogs shut. Proceed. Yes. Well, we go through a checklist. Yep. Essentially, make sure everybody's uh, good to go to start, mm -hmm. and then uh, they begin. Um, the operator on the outside begins compressing the chamber um, as pretty much as fast as the patient can equalize. So for so equalize, talk about that. Uh, equalizing the ears and sinuses. Yes. Yeah. So the divers would be familiar with this process, but uh, the divers in the audience, but. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's like, uh, you know, as you're going up in a plane or coming down in a plane, yeah. your ears pop, if your sinus may get a little squeeze, and it's, this is the same thing. Yeah, just a little bit more abrupt. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So and then, what does it feel like? Well, the temperature increases because we're pushing all those molecules together, and uh, we have the capacity. Um, when, they, when Frank set up this chamber, he went all in and we do have the capacity to heat and cool the chamber, but you can't completely overcome uh, the laws of physics. So it does get warm in there, um, but it, it cools off very rapidly mm -hmm. and it's uh, quite comfortable. For the divers, it's the, the biggest difference is there's no visual reference in your change of depth. Right. So you're, that's you're, the hardest thing your, for them to get used to. You had to clear your ears, <laughs> but you're still not underwater. Yeah. You're, you, yeah. What would you like to add, Diana? It's actually surprisingly comfortable mm -hmm. in there, but it does feel a little awkward as you begin because nothing's changing around you, but you're, you definitely feel the pressure changes. You do, and I was struck. So, you know, when you learn physics in high school, PV equals NRT, that's the formula, and you're like, oh, N's the amount of gas is there, R is a constant, so that means that the only variable on the right side of the equal sign is temperature. Mm -hmm. And so I, I knew that. I had never experienced it. Yeah. And it's striking. Mm -hmm. It yes. gets warm, even though the yeah. cooling, I mean, not terribly warm, but <laughs> noticeably warm for sure. Yeah. I was also struck by some other things. Uh, you do have to clear your ears a bunch, but that's okay. I expected that. Voices sound different. Mm -hmm. Sounds are transmitted differently. Um, it's because the air is more dense. Um, we have had a gl uh, inflated glove. It shrank. The balloon shrink, you know, it's it's fascinating, um, and it's it's sort of an experience of the, the physical world in an unusual way. I I, yes. I, I think it's yeah. really cool. Yeah. So tell them about coming back up. In a lot of ways, coming back up is going to be the reverse. It's going to cool down pretty abruptly as mm -hmm. you come up from pressure. Um, do feel a similar popping in your ears. Um, and the sort of the noises continue. It is mm -hmm. quite noisy. It's a large piece of machinery yep. doing a lot of dramatic things. So you have a lot of machinery type noise. And the sound is conducted more uh, readily than normal. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take a little break. And uh, after the break, we're going to talk about specifics of uh, the various gas bubble treatments uh, we do. So uh, again, this is Craig Thomas, much more on medicine with guests. Uh, Diana Felton and Jeff Nance from the Hyperbaric Treatment Center, and we'll be back in a minute. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Freedom, is it a feeling? Is it a place? Is it an idea? At Dive Heart, we believe freedom is all of these and more, regardless of your ability. Dive Heart wants to help you escape the bonds of this world and defy gravity. Since 2001, Dive Heart has helped children, adults, and veterans of all abilities go where they have never gone before. Dive Heart has helped them transition to their new normal. Search DiveHeart.org and share our mission with others, and in the process, help people of all abilities imagine the possibilities in their lives. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science, where we'll dig into science, dig into the meat of science, dig into the joy and delight of science. We'll discover why science is indeed fun, why science is interesting, why people should care about science, and care about the research that's being done out there. It's all great, it's all entertaining, it's all educational, so I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science. Welcome back. This is Craig Thomas, uh, your host on Much More on Medicine with 
uh, guests Diana Felton and Jeff Nance from the Hyperbaric Treatment Center. And I see you again. Just before the break, we were talking about sort of the history and the general circumstances and what it's like to be in a dive chamber. Now we're going to talk about the physics, my favorite. <laughs> um, honestly, this is pretty straightforward. And uh, Diana, maybe you could talk about the relationship of pressure and volume and why this all works. Sure. I think the key thing for understanding the processes that happen when people get decompression sickness or the bends or other dive emergencies has a lot to do with what we call the bubble theory, which is bubbles of gas building up in the body. And the key to understanding that is that pressure and volume or, or size of the bubbles is are directly inversely proportionate, meaning that when the pressure goes up, the size of the volume goes down, the size of the bubbles goes down, and vice versa, when the pressure goes down, the size of the bubbles goes up. So as you go underwater or down in the decompression chamber, the pressure is going up, and the vo so that means the volume is going down and the bubbles are getting smaller. Yep. And the same thing happens on ascent. So when you come up from scuba diving or you come up in the decompression chamber, the pressure is decreasing back to the normal atmosphere and the size of the bubbles is getting bigger. Yep. So if you're diving and you're down below the water, the bubbles are small, they have the opportunity to uh, disseminate out of your bloodstream and into your body tissues because they are small, mm -hmm. because the pressure is increased. And if enough builds up, and then as you when you come up and they get bigger, if they're stuck out in the tissues, that's when you start to run into problems. Got it. And the reason why the treatment works so well is that we go back down to the pressure and make those bubbles back down to small and help them come out of the tissues again. Perfect. That's a nice explanation. And I was thinking about potential real-world example, which I'm going to try next time I go on a plane. I would suggest we bring a little balloon, blow it up, and see how big it is when we're at cruising elevation. It should be, I would think, about a quarter less size. I don't recommend the opposite, which is you could blow up the balloon up in the air, and then as you land, it would pop. So let's not do that. <laughs> um, but that's sort of the bubble thing. Um, so, Jeff, anything you want to add to that? Or maybe no, we'll talk a, about the... a pretty good summary of yeah, it, yeah. I thought she did well. Yeah. So thinking about this a little more, though, it seems like you could have two different kinds of air problems. You could have bubbles in the bloodstream or... Uh, joints or wherever they end up, but you could also have expanding air in other parts of the body. And I'm thinking of the inner or the middle ear, the sinuses, but probably more importantly for this discussion in the chest. After all, our lungs are full of air. And uh, as it turns out, there are two different kinds of expanding air problems. So one is related to those. So let's start with that kind of air problem. Sure. So that uh, we refer to as a gas embolism, or sometimes mm -hmm. called arterial gas embolism, or AGE. Mm -hmm. And gas embolism is exactly that. It occurs when the air in the small parts of the lungs, the alveoli, expands and ruptures. Mm -hmm. And that air is then released into the bloodstream. And air in the bloodstream is not Never good. Not good. Yeah. And those bubbles can travel, and most concerningly, they can travel to the brain. Yep. and they can cause obstruction of the blood flow, gets lodged in the blood vessels of the brain, cause obstruction of the blood flow, and then basically the parts of the brain cannot continue to work. So you end up with problems um, that are very similar to strokes in some ways, paralysis, difficulty speaking, in severe cases, unconsciousness. And this mm -hmm. is a major cause of divers coming to the surface on ascent and, be, and becoming unconscious right upon arriving at the surface. Right. And to be clear, we're talking about scuba divers here. Correct. Um, yeah. So interestingly, a few weeks ago, uh, Tom Forney hosted a discussion about the early recognition and treatment of strokes, which of course is all about finding the stroke and figuring out a way to uh, minimize or remove the clot. Well, this is sort of the same thing, which is, uh, oh, it's not a clot. It's a bubble, but the net effect is the same. Mm -hmm. Whatever's downstream of it didn't get in blood. So again, it's uh, early recognition, early treatment to make the bubble small and let the blood get through. Exactly. And one minor difference is that in a stroke with a blood clot, you usually have one blood clot. In, in gas embolism from rapid ascent from diving, you can often have multiple bubbles in the brain. So right. the picture is not always as 
clear as it may be from a blood clot type stroke. But it is many of the similar type symptoms. Yes, and so what that means is, uh, like everything in medicine it seems, uh, history is key. Mm -hmm. So if I'm hearing you correctly, uh, these kinds of symptoms should be present almost immediately on surfacing. Yes. Uh, maybe even before you surface. Um, exactly. And so if we get a history like that, then we kind of have a good idea of where we should be looking. Mm -hmm. And so it does I, raise a, a problem as well in that many of these people also run into problems with drowning and near drowning as a complication. Because if you're coming, ascending to the surface and you become unconscious before you make it, you're going to aspirate some seawater. And if you're unconscious at the surface, you may run into trouble as well. So again, um, very can sometimes be a complicated picture. Nothing good happens if you become unconscious underwater. I think it's safe to say. Um, the, uh, so that was a nice description. So how do you minimize the chance of this happening to you if you're a scuba diver? The main number one thing is don't hold your breath, particularly yep. on ascent. Yep. So continued regular breathing, slow ascents is the number one way. Um, diving with a buddy is useful as well to have someone available if you were to become unconscious, but the number one thing is slow ascent with continued regular breathing. Yep, I think that's true. When I learned to scuba, there was a whole bunch of rules. I'm kind of a simple guy, so I came up with these ones. Breathe normally. Don't go too deep. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Don't come up fast uh, and don't get lost. Um, and honestly, I think that almost all scuba related events uh, fit in some of those parameters. So now let's mm -hmm. talk about the other kind, the bins, the one those bridge workers had. Uh, and I'm going to preface it by saying we learned a lot um, years ago about the, how deep you can go and how you should treat them. Mm -hmm. But what we've also learned is that human physiology is variable. Things are unpredictable. And um, uh, I'm going to have you, Jeff, tell me how they developed the dive tables in the first place, because I think it's a sobering experience. Well, yeah, it was the Navy used human, human subjects, but Haldane used goats. Uh -huh. uh, so, yeah, a number of different uh, animals, people and animals have... And, given a lot for and, uh, what we know now. And to be specific, what the Navy did was they bent people. Yes. Oh, look, if you're down at 90 feet for more than, I don't remember what the number is. More than 30 minutes. 30 yeah. minutes, uh, and you come up, you're going to have the bends, or at least a 50-50 chance, yeah. I think it is, that you'll have the bends. Um, that's how the tables were developed. I think yes. it's astonishing they yes. did that. Um, but it also, the 50-50 thing matters, because it means that you can... You may not get bent if you uh, exceed the limits of your computer or the dive tables, but it also means that you may get bent with following the tables or, and or the computer. The advent of yes. dive computers, incidentally, didn't change anything. Yes. Still, people get bent. And about half of all people who get bent were within the parameters. So much more importantly is early recognition of symptoms and seek attention so it can be ascertained. Let's talk about the bends now, how you treat it. Yeah, so generally symptoms of the bends are going to come on fairly quickly after ascent from a dive. Um, most people notice some symptoms within six hours and almost all within the first 24 hours. So what kinds of symptoms? So the main things people feel are joint pain is mm -hmm. usually is the most common. Some people get uh, itching and a rash. Mm -hmm. um, Which is of course an example of interrupted blood flow to the skin yes. in the little tiny vessels. Uh, paresthesias, meaning numbness and tingling to the mm -hmm. fingers, the toes, mm -hmm. and it can be more severe than that. People can have paralysis, they can have um, difficulty walking, mm -hmm. and uh, in very severe cases you can have effects on the, the respiratory, cardiorespiratory system, so um, difficulty with your heart and your lungs, breathing, chest pain. Those are pretty unusual symptoms but can occur in severe cases. So it sounds a little bit like in strokes that the they could present with a variety of symptoms, and it's wise if you've been scuba diving to, to if you have something strange, a little balance trouble, or oh, I don't know, numbness or tingling, or this weird itching, or more serious symptoms, seek help mm -hmm. because the symptoms can progress, uh, and 
treatment works. Mm -hmm. No point in seeking help if there's no treatment. There's a treatment. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the treatment. So the treatment is going to be repressurizing what mm -hmm. we call crushing the bubbles. Yeah. Meaning making those bubbles small again and helping encourage the bubbles to come out of the areas where they are causing the problems, mm -hmm. the joints, the blood vessels, um, the tissues. And in addition, adding 100% oxygen really helps uh, perfuse the tissues that aren't getting adequate oxygen. So the combination really helps treat this and it's usually a treatment of about five hours in the chamber um, at a depth of about 60 feet with slowly coming up slowly so allowing the time for the bubbles to come out of the tissues into the bloodstream and be breathed the air to be breathed mm -hmm. out and um, generally people do quite well with the first treatment but most people require a second treatment the next day, possibly even a third or a fourth, depending on their symptoms and how they feel. Perfect. And as most divers know, the initial treatment, the first aid treatment, in essence, is 100% oxygen. And the other thing is, what the real issue here is the difference in the pressure where you are diving and in the air you're breathing. So sea level, it's all from the water depth. But if you were to get in a plane or even drive over the saddle road, uh, that difference is much larger, let alone if you were to scuba dive up on Mauna Kea, which has happened and did result in the bends. Uh, so that's an important concept to remember. Um, let's talk a little bit. Any other comments about treatment of the bends? Treatment? No, well, we uh, have or any about the bends at all. We uh, we have the capacity to treat much deeper than sixty feet as well, mm -hmm. and so we do have some some very deep tables uh, as deep as two hundred eighty feet which were rarely used, but we do have that capacity. Well, and in Hawaii, there are people diving very deep, mm -hmm. I know. Uh, and there's also some other, other uh, technologies out, different gas mixtures or even mm -hmm. rebreathers, so that capability could be valuable. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess before we leave the bends, I would just like to say there may be some stigma attached by uh, divers uh, thinking, oh, I must have done something wrong, that's why I've got this sore shoulder, but I'm not going to go see anybody because, you know, yeah. I screwed up. No. Uh, first of all, we in medicine, we treat people regardless of how they <laughs> came to need it. But secondly, yes. don't forget, about half the time, you were within your tables or you were yes. following the computer. So if you have weird symptoms after scuba diving, get on oxygen, get a medical evaluation, and if need be, the hyperbaric chamber will treat you. So Diana, I'm gonna switch gears here. You're mm -hmm. a toxicologist. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about uh, some toxic toxicologic uh, uh, interventions the chamber can perform. Yeah, so one of the other uses of the hyperbaric oxygen treatment is to treat carbon monoxide poisoning. Tell me about carbon monoxide poisoning. Well, carbon monoxide poisoning is when you breathe too much carbon monoxide and it replaces oxygen on your hemoglobin and prevents you from getting adequate oxygen to your tissues. So the most common ways people get poison from carbon monoxide are um, gen using generators inside, uh, breathing car exhaust mm -hmm. in an enclosed area. Um, those are the main ways we see it. Got it. We see it. Yeah, and carbon monoxide has a tremendous affinity for hemoglobin and the idea is if you can get lots of oxygen, pressure is a way to mm -hmm. do that, mm -hmm. uh, you can minimize the effects. And, and just like with diving, the first treatment is 100% uh, oxygen, but then pressurized is pressurized. better. Yeah. Well, listen, I'd like to thank both of you today. It's been fun, and uh, I hope that people are getting an awareness of this uh, tremendous asset to the community, and uh, we can serve our uh, local and tourist divers. So I appreciate Thanks for it. having us. Yeah. Again, this is Craig Thomas on Much More on Medicine, and we uh, had guests today from the Hyperbaric Treatment Center. Thanks. Till next time.